Tools for Everyone. My name is Kathleen Deckler, and I am the Director of Positive Supports for the Division of Developmental Disabilities, and I'm going to be your facilitator today. I am excited uh, to share this information with you. I've been teaching Tools of Choice, which is what uh, this is based on for almost 10 years now, and I tell people often that it is the best thing that ever happened to me, and I mean that. Um, I use tools every day. I try to use it in all of my interactions. Um, so thank you for being here today, and I hope that you find um, tools as impactful as I have. Um, before I get too much into this, I want to um, preface this with um, this is an overview of tools of choice. And so it is not intended to take the place of the positive behavior support uh, requirement for um, for division uh, for staff who work for our providers. Um, the full tools of choice class um, does count for positive behavior supports, but not this overview session. Um, so what we're really gonna do here today is um, share a little bit of background and provide an overview, give a little bit of practice, um, but not the full tools of choice class. So this does not count for positive behavior supports and it is definitely a great introduction to um, the content and components and tools of choice. Uh, for the best experience today, stay muted. That's going to be really easy for you to do because um, Kat, our wonderful moderator, is in charge of unmuting people. You are you are able to unmute. She's just going to have to do it for you. And if you want to, uh, you would just use the hand raise option um, in order to do that. Uh, you're also welcome to participate by using the chat box. That's really the primary form that we've used in this in the past, but it's a nice small group today. So we could definitely um, use either the chat box or help you unmute. Um, the other thing that I think is going to help you have the best experience today would be something to write on. Um, we're going to do a couple of activities, which I think will be helpful if you have something to write on and also just, um, some notes in general. Kat is going to attach this PowerPoint to the web page. Um, so folks could use that, um, but still might want some other notes. So what, what you're going to learn today are what is positive behavior supports and re really what are the universal strategies as part of that? Uh, we're going to share some fundamental facts of behavior. Uh, we're going to talk about how we talk about behavior. So, um, really just trying to make sure we all get on the same page about the language that we use. Uh, we're going to talk about how we categorize behavior and how that helps us to determine, uh, uh, our response. And we'll also share some examples of potential responses based on the category of behavior. Um, we're going to talk about coercion. We're going to give some examples of coercion and we're going to talk about, um, what happens to people who are experiencing coercion. Um, and when we talk about those effects, I think that's going to feed into why we suggest you avoid those. Um, and we're going to share 10 specific examples of things that we, that are the most common types of coercion. And then we're going to, uh, end with some proactive strategies that you can use um, to improve your relationships and interactions. So what is positive behavior support? There is a lot that goes into this short uh, definition or to the short term here. So the science of behavior or behavior analysis has been formally investigated uh, demonstrating the science of behavior since the 1940s. There have been hundreds of thousands of studies and demonstrations of the principles and techniques, and many uh, programs and treatment projects, schools, training curriculums uh, use the principles uh, and, te and techniques um, developed by the science of behavior. So for positive behavior support, it takes the public health model to structure the interventions. And if you see this triangle here uh, on the screen, um, that's a good visual um, for this, for the model. So the green base represents the universal strategies that support a quality of life for the entire population. And in a healthy population, 80 to 90% of people will only need that universal level of support um, for a, a high quality of life. 
And then you see the yellow section there in the middle, and that center represents the population at risk for poor outcomes. So uh, interventions for this at risk population often look like an extra scoop of that universal strategy, but are intended to be short term. Um, that extra scoop part is intended to be short term and faded as risk decreases. And in a healthy population, 10 to 15% of people might need that level of, of intervention. And then the small red triangle at the top, um, that is that represents the, the folks in crisis and in need of short-term intensive supports. And in a healthy population, 5% or fewer people might need that, that, that level of support. So it's important to consider these uh, levels as we, as we go on because the content we're going to talk about today is really that green area area down at the bottom. It's the universal strategies that everybody needs for a high quality of life and really are the basis for all other interventions that we might um, provide. So uh, these universal relationship building strategies are really uh, vital for any other intervention that we might provide. So the idea behind tools is, and philosophy and its philosophy are that we focus on being kind and caring all the time. And that can be difficult for uh, us to accept and sometimes leads people to think something along the lines of that we're just letting people get away with um, their you know, undesirable behavior or their poor behavior. Um, and in reality, it's really a, a, a a shift in our perspective and um, and the idea is that we don't have to be mean or cold or angry or upset when when uh, we're seeing undesirable behavior. And in fact, being kind and non-emotional can be more effective in calming down a situation. So really, it's the idea that we don't want to make things worse. We want to avoid creating or, or being coercive. We want to avoid responding with coercion and creating a worsening for the for the person. And so being kind and caring means that we keep our cool and we don't take things personally, even when they definitely can feel very personal. Um, we avoid reacting emotionally um, and um, we really try not to do things that would get back at the person or make you know, make them hurt as a way to get back to them. And this is really hard. <laughs> um, it takes lifelong practice. I tell people it's my goal in life to avoid coercion coercion for a whole day. Um, and it's really hard because our society is coercive. Um, you know, we were raised uh, with uh, coercion. Our systems and our communities are coercive. Um, it's really just common in our culture. If you went to watch uh, after we go over these um, examples of coercion, next time you watch a sitcom, you're going to see how even these great families that are on TV are using coercion in their interactions with each other. So it's really just enmeshed in our culture. Um, and so it can be hard to to make this shift. Um, and I, so I encourage you as we go through this content today to think about the relationships that are really important to you and think about the impact that the strategies and skills that we're talking about today might have on those really important relationships to you. Because again, this is a universal strategy. So it's not, um, these aren't the skills that I use when I uh, work with a person with a disability or a child or, um, you know, some specific population of people. This is the skills that I use when I talk to people, everyone. So let's get into this. I'm about to give you your first opportunity to use the chat box. So go ahead and orient yourself to that chat box there in the uh, bottom right corner. You'll see your chat option and uh, you should be able to chat everyone. And I recommend that you do that so everybody can see each other's um, posts. Otherwise, if you happen to, to uh, um, just send it to the presenter or something, I'll do my best to read what you what you say. So thank you, Molly. You're so quick. Uh, so what is behavior? Find your chat box and give me your definition of behavior. Molly says it's anything that can be observed and measured. Anything you do, Angie says. 
actions that can be observed and measured, Leandra. Positive or negative interactions, Vanessa says, yes. Okay, so we have some themes here, action, uh, observed and measured, um, any, Janet says, any behaviors that are seen and count or counted, seen and counted, okay. So here's my, here's my definition, uh, definitely along the lines of many things that you guys were all saying here, anything a person does that can be seen and counted. So that's really broad and it's important that we focus on, Sharon says includes verbal and nonverbal, very important, yes. It's really important that we um, expand our definition of behavior to anything a person does. Oftentimes we talk about behavior only when we're talking about someone's undesirable behavior or the behavior that we want um, to, to replace. Uh, so when we talk about behavior, we want to make sure that we're really thinking about all behavior, anything a person does um, that can be seen and counted. And that's going to help us shift to the more positive, uh, desirable stuff. So, so let's make a list. I am going to type what folks um, write in the chat box or say, I would like some examples of common behaviors in your environment. And I am navigating to my... So in the chat box, tell me what are some be common behaviors in your environment? Walking, smiling, eating. My poor spelling. Hugs, kisses, talking. These are great. Going back up to see what I missed. How about two more? You guys are doing great. I think I've gotten all the ones on here that are there so far. If I could just have two more tantrums. Okay, one more. Thank you, Janet, for giving us that one. Reacting thing, okay. Okay, so I am now gonna get a different color highlight and I am going to first I'm going to circle some things you notice about the things that I am circling I was a little hesitant about that last one but what do you notice about the things that I'm circling that I circled Negative, yes, negative behaviors, exactly. You guys did a great job. Oftentimes when we do this, the whole list is full of negatives because when we think about behavior, we often just think about the negative things. Um, and, and I already asked you to expand to thinking about all behaviors and you guys have already done it. Great job. Okay, so I'm getting rid of my highlights and I am going to highlight again uh, something else this time. So... Um, I'm going to circle some things now, and when you see them, I want you to tell me what do you notice about the ones that I am circling? What do you notice about the ones I circled this time? This is harder. I just want to... Difficult to count or measure, non-specific. Well, Molly, you just, that was a great answer. <laughs> I say it's difficult, and then Molly just gives me a textbook answer. I love it. Thank you. Exactly. So they're not specific. You know, a, a tantrum isn't a tantrum until me until somebody is on the floor uh, and could be here down the street. 
and um, is hitting a body part against the ground. That th Then it's a tantrum. But for other people, a tantrum might just be, you know, somebody jumping up and down and saying, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. The definition for, for a tantrum is very wide and really depends on who is, uh, who's observing, who's, who's the opinion giver. Uh, same with giving affirmation that could look so different. So for some people that might be a high five for some, it might be a smile and a nod of like, you did that. And other people, it might be, you know, saying something verbally, um, uh, working could look like lots of different things. It might look like typing. It might look like talking. It could look like, you know, putting pieces together into a box, just really lots of things that could be working. Uh, same thing with reacting, lots of different ways that we could react. So it's important to remember that when we talk about behavior, we want to talk about it in specific actions so that everybody knows what we're talking about. So everybody's in on it. We all, uh, we don't have to each provide our own definition of a tantrum and then see where we are. Someone can just tell us Johnny was laying on the floor. He um, was yelling, I'm not going. Um, and he hit his head three times. That Those are things I can see and count. And when I look for change in Johnny's behavior over time, I really can see it. If I just said he had a tantrum and I, he had a tantrum yesterday and he had a tantrum the day before, I'm not seeing any change in behavior because I'm not really talking about behavior in those specific terms. So there's a great example here. You know, you could say Kathleen's rude, but it'd be much more specific. And if you want to target my behavior for change, it's important to know the things I'm doing that are rude. For example, I was like, look at her. What was she thinking? So uh, Kathleen is making rude face, making uh, a, a face that says that she is grossed out and loudly talking about people's clothing. Those are things that we can target for change now that everybody knows what rude thing we're talking about that I was doing. Okay, so we're going to talk about behavior in measurable specific terms. So the things that we're actually seeing, really important if you think about documentation, really important if you think about um, talking to, um, you know, a team of people who might uh, be in your circle of support. Just really important that everybody knows um, what exactly we're talking about. So there are some times where it's helpful to think about a category of behavior. So, you know, you know, one of those big old terms and we have, we have four big old terms that we're good with and we like them because based on where the behavior falls, it can help guide your response. So helpful categories of behavior to use are uh, desirable and there's two there. There's significant and just okay. So significant are those like big deal things. The just okay or like that everyday kind of stuff that, you know, probably it really isn't getting much attention right now, but because we're going to start spending more time, um, we've expanded our definition of behavior to talk about, think about any behavior, and we really want to shift our focus to being kind and caring all the time. And so we're going to start looking at those just okay behaviors in our environment and targeting them for positive consequences, targeting them for our opportunity to have a stay close interaction and start building our relationship. We're going to start using these just okays as an opportunity for more. Uh, and so we have those two desirable types of behavior, significant, just okay. And then we have two types of undesirable behavior. We have junk and serious. Serious is that stuff that's physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. And the junk is everything else that, the pe that a person might do that is um, not... Un, that is undesirable, that's not helpful to them, it's not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or legal, but it's definitely harmful to their, like, social lives. Um, they're probably things that are annoying. They might have been age typical at some point in time, but the person never learned that skill to, like, replace it. Um, so, uh, I don't mean junk, like, just, you know, don't think about it, forget about it, just let it go. I mean junk, like, we have a skill for that. And if it's that annoying stuff that, um, you know, isn't physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal, but it's not helping them succeed, it's not improving their quality of life, then we have a response for that called pivot. So, again, categories of behavior are helpful in order to determine our response. So, let's talk a little bit more about these uh, these categories. Uh, it's important to consider when 
it happens, but in the context of this. So when you think about, let's take one behavior and kind of walk it through these. Um, going to the gym. For me, in the context of Kathleen going to the gym, that is a significant desirable behavior. It would be a quality of life improvement, certainly. Um, so that's one one reason I think it's significant. And, I'm, and it's something I'm not currently doing. So it would be a big deal if I started, right? That's a big, significantly desirable behavior. It improves quality of life. It's something I'm not currently doing. And therefore, for me, it is a significant desirable behavior. Same behavior going to the gym for Michael Phelps is just okay. He's an athlete. He goes to the gym every day probably. Does that mean he just never needs to hear an attaboy for it? No, he still needs an attaboy for his hard work, just not as much as I need one uh, because it's a significant desirable behavior. So those just okay behaviors are an opportunity for us. Um, they just are things that the person's already pretty much doing. We kind of expect it out of them. Um, and so they might that's they might not really be getting um, the kind of attention that we could provide and help change that environment and increase the the positive reinforcement available. Okay, so going to the gym for for uh, that person who just wants to leer at other people or try to pick up on somebody at the gym that's annoying. It's junk. It's undesirable, but it's not physically harmful to themselves, others' property or illegal. But it's not helping them make any friends. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody's there to to get hit on or talk to or whatever. So that would be annoying junk behavior. And then there's the they're going to the gym for a person who um, recently had surgery and is told that they need to stay off their uh, ankle, um, you know, until it heals or until they're cleared by the doctor. They're back at the gym. That's serious undesirable behavior. That's physically harmful to themselves. Other to themselves. So um, that would be serious behavior. So based on the context, I just took one behavior of going to the gym, and depending on the context of the behavior, it could fall into any one of those categories, just depending on the person and the timing of it. So significant desirable behaviors. These are things we want to teach. We want to model. We want to increase these happening. These are skills people need to learn in order to be successful. These are big deal things. Just okay behaviors. These are the kinds of things that are already happening in our, in our environment. We kind of expect them, um, you know, um, so, you know, somebody who has good manners, they say thank you. Somebody who goes to work, shows up at work, you know, those are, these are the just okay behaviors, um, shutting the door when you come inside. And often with just okay, we don't notice them <laughs> until they don't happen. <laughs> and then it becomes a problem. So for, I think leaving the door open is a really good example of, uh, you know, people don't often get a thank you when they close the door behind them, but if they leave it open, they're going to hear about it because then it really shifted into junk behavior of they left the door wide open. So just okay behaviors, these are things that we're not currently uh, taking the opportunity for to, to recognize. And this is a real opportunity that we have to increase the positive interactions in our environment. We can look to these just okay behaviors and start providing some positive consequences for them. So for junk behavior, this is really, these are like sucking all the energy out of us. We are spending a lot of time on trying to get these to just stop. Um, and which is not particularly helpful. We have another skill called pivot that we're going to talk about later. And that's really the junk behavior response pivot. So we're going to avoid reacting to this junk behavior. Um, and, and in order to help us do that, it's important to remember that it's not physically harmful to themselves, others, property or illegal. So we can have a bit of room to try this pivot. That's a different intervention, and we can see some improvement from that. Um, it can help make the behavior less likely to happen in the future, which is our goal. So um, it's just helpful to remember we're going to categorize it as junk because that's going to help us remember to pivot. So I, I'm going to have to ask you guys for some more behaviors. What are some common junk behaviors? I would go back to our list, but you guys really came up with so many desirable behaviors. Um, I don't, I'm don't. i not going to go back to it, um, but let's come up with some. What are some junk behaviors? What are some junk behaviors? 
things that are not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. Nose picking, that is an excellent example. So much attention gets provided for the nose picking, uh, but it's not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. Eye rolling, talking with your mouth full, the sigh, Crystal said. I know that sigh well, yes. Cursing, swearing, yes, you guys are on the right track. This is good. Phone time in meetings, yes, being on your phone, screaming in public, great, stomping, yes. These are all excellent examples of junk behavior. And I appreciate that you guys brought some of these up here because some of them are verging towards um, potential for serious behavior, right? They they can ramp up and ramp up into something else. And that's really important to remember about junk behavior. We know that many instances of serious behavior stemmed from junk being uh, reacted to and escalating into serious behavior. So I appreciate that you guys labeled some things uh, like stomping and screaming in public as junk because um, they are not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. And when they get responded to, it can really ramp up into a stay close, hot, or serious behavior situation. Silence can be positive or drunk. Totally agree, Sharon. Really depends on the context of when it's happening. It really, it really depends on it. Okay. So here's some examples of junk, and you guys came up with several of these, um, swearing or cursing, threatening, that was kind of like screaming in public, um, name calling, saying mean things, not going to work, you know, skipping work. Um, okay. So let's consider why. Why do people do drunk behavior? Why does a person curse at another person? Go ahead and use your chat. Why would why does a person do that? Why are they why would they curse at someone? They're aggravated, attention, frustration, express frustration. Yeah. That's some great empathy, really. That's really good empathy. Habit, Angie says, attention. Think it's funny. Yeah. These are all reasons. Yeah. What about complaining about food? Or, you know, other people or, you know, complaining when, why might people do that? Attention. Unhappy with themselves, yeah. Insecurity, mm hmm Christy and Janet are really on the same page there. Nonverbal communication. What about slamming the door? Why might somebody slam the door? Angry, upset, yeah. Being a teenager, <laughs> we talked about, you know, I think it is important to just, again, remind yourself that many of the examples of junk behavior are at one point age appropriate behaviors that just didn't find another, another appropriate skill to replace it. So people do the junk, be do junk behavior for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, you guys named many of them attention, trying to get out of the situation. You know, this is a good way to get people to leave me alone. Try to get that thing I was wanting um, to get even. Um, you Also, I see a couple examples in here about it's just the thing that happened, really. You know, the wind blew. It just it just happened. Nobody did that. Um, somebody wanted to hear the noise. Yeah. So so. People do drunk behavior because it works for them in a moment. Um, and it, it's not typically, uh, it's, it's also, it's been something that they have been doing a long time. I noticed in one uh, up above, like the cursing, that's, that's one that's a habit. You know, they don't have another word to describe it. 
It's a habit. It's what they know to say in that moment when they're feeling in this way. Um, so remember that that people do drunk behavior because they're getting something out of it. They're getting that attention. They're getting that, um, um, you know, response in some kind of way. And it's the skill that they've had that they've used before and uh, will do again. It's the thing that works. So un what undesirable behavior isn't drunk? That's the serious things that are physically harmful to themselves, others, property or illegal. We have a skill for that called stay close hot. And um, some examples of, of that would be, you know, so if somebody got hit, uh, somebody threw a chair, banging their head with force, stealing. These are all things that are physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. So what should you do? You Stay closed hot, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. If that is ineffective and things continue to um, continue uh, down a serious uh, path, then if the person has a safety crisis plan, it's time to use it. You should know it well and be prepared to implement it um, when you see serious behavior. Also, 988 is there for behavioral health crisis and uh, could also provide support to a person who is engaging in serious behavior. So let's just review these quickly again. Uh, before we shift into some of the more proactive, uh, what do we do now? We've we know what category this behavior is in, and now what should we do? So uh, desirable, significant, those are big deal things. Uh, those are the quality of life improvers, the skills that people are working on, things we want to teach, model, motivate, increase in the environment. And then there's the just okay. And those are things that really are probably happening all day long, uh, but they generally uh, aren't getting a lot of attention and then we're going to use those as our opportunity to provide positive consequences. So we're going to start looking for that just okay behavior. You know, they answered and they answered your question. They said, thank you. You know, so we're talking about being polite and um, responding. And then there's the serious. So undesirable behavior that's significant, uh, that is physically harmful to themselves, others, property or illegal. So hitting, taking off your gloves in public, those kinds of big deal things. Uh, and then there's the junk, that stuff that we're spending a lot of our time on, um, that aren't physically harmful to themselves, others, property or illegal, but are definitely not helping anyone socially and are holding them back from, uh, engaging in more just okay and significantly desirable behavior. Okay. So let's go over some fundamental facts. So things that we know to be true about behavior that can, uh, help us again and as we identify what response we want to have and kind of beef up our rationale for for using them so uh first one that the environment is responsible for the behavior so you know based on the person's learning history uh their experiences their physiological uh state those those uh, aspects of the environment uh, are responsible for the behavior so the behavior is always right, given the person's environment, their history, um, and their previous experiences. So I don't mean that's like the, you know, the right behavior if somebody got, you know, somebody punched them or whatever, the behavior is always right. I don't mean right like it was a good thing for them to do. I mean right as in it was the thing that they knew to do to best meet their needs in that moment based on their history, based on their physio physiology, uh, based on their previous experiences. That was the thing they knew to best meet their needs. So it was right based on the environment. The second fundamental fact is that uh, consequences can either strengthen or weaken a behavior. And the only way we can know if a consequence uh was uh you know reinforcing or or punishment so is to by what happens in the future if it was reinforcing then that strengthens the behavior it happens more or um more often or with more uh intensity or it can weaken the behavior it would be a punishment it would weaken the behavior and make it happen less often um or or uh for you know less amount of time it would, it would lessen it or weaken that behavior 
Uh, so we really need to look at what happens afterwards. So identifying consequence and identifying that th how that behavior plays out in the future, if it happens more often or less often, then we know the impact of our consequences. Number three is very hard. It takes time. It takes time. We want to be consistent and uh, we want to take data so that we know over time how things are changing. Um, and if you're if things are not effective, you know, tweaking it after a couple of weeks makes a lot of sense, uh, but it needs time to uh, for changes to take effect and to change behavior in the environment. So that kind of patience and consistency is really important. Past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. So it's important to consider um, how a person has uh, behaved previously in this situation. Um, though that helps us, we can anticipate and um, and make changes into the make changes to the environment um, to help prevent the undesirable behaviors from happening in the future. So it's helpful to remember past experiences, and we can make changes and and um, and see if we can anticipate and and prevent problems from happening in the future. Here's a big one. And we're going to start talking here in a few slides a lot about this word coercive or coercion here. So giving negative uh, coercive consequences. So creating a worsening for people. Um, Typic it results in more problems. Uh, so. Undesirable behavior of a person meets coercion and punishment and it will escalate the situation. So our goal is to shift and really start thinking about more desirable behaviors that are happening in the environment, shifting our focus to those and really starting to focus on avoiding these, identifying what coercive punishing consequences we're providing right now and how we can avoid providing them in the future. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about this here in a few moments. And so, uh, along a similar thread, in the long run, behavior responds better to positive consequences. And so when we start shifting our attention to desirable behavior, that just okay stuff that right now we just kind of expect in our environment, we start shifting and recognizing those desirable behaviors and when they're occurring, we start shifting the environment and providing and increasing the positivity in that environment. So behavior responds better to those positive consequences. It takes time and consistency. So I mentioned this earlier. So positive practices set the foundation for all other interventions. This is the universal level here. It's not about fixing people. It's really about improving the quality of life. So when we talk about the a discipline, uh, a lot of times we think, um, you know, being strict or uh, using punishment, you know, that's to, tends to be how we think of the term discipline. When in fact, math is a discipline, science is a discipline, English is a discipline. Discipline is something that you teach and model. Um, and so if we're using that punishment idea, that mean strict idea, uh, in our as our discipline, then what are we actually teaching people? Because discipline is about teaching and it's about learning. And so if we're using punishment as as our method of discipline, then we're actually teaching and modeling and motivating exactly what we don't want. Um, so as you shift the make this shift, think about discipline in that positive way, in that teaching way that we're modeling and teaching and motivating the desirable behaviors that we want to see. So uh, that's going to help us um, improve our relationship and maintain our relationships. Um, and again, just that idea that if we're using punishment as our discipline, we are actually teaching and motivating and modeling exactly what we don't want to see. So to effectively change behavior, we have to find the stuff, identify what are the things that we want to happen in this environment. We need to teach to those. <laughs> And uh, we need to start paying them off. We need to start paying off desirable behaviors. They need to get more attention than the undesirable stuff 
gets. So it's really important that we think about all the categories of behavior <clears throat> as we start thinking about target behaviors. A lot of times we think about target behaviors just in this bottom one, the stuff that we wanted to get rid of, we want to decrease in the environment. Um, that's the, that tends to be the way that we think about target behaviors when, in fact, we also need to identify, we really need to focus on these top two. What are the behaviors that we want to see more often? Those are our targets. What do we need to do to teach them? What are, and they can be those alternative behaviors to the undesirable stuff. Um, and then, then we can use them as a replacement behavior. But we really want to shift our target behavior thinking into that desirable stuff that we want to teach, model, motivate, the stuff we want to see more of in our environment. And uh, in order to motivate the desirable behavior, we have to start emphasizing it. That has to be what gets attention in this environment. The healthy stuff, the desirable behaviors, that's what gets attention. And when the undesirable behavior happens, we do our best to minimize uh, our, our responses. So, so we're focusing more emphasis on the the more emotion more words more reactions on the desirable behavior and we want to interrupt uh you know undesirable behavior if we must um we're going to do it with as little attention as possible as little eye contact as little touch as little reaction as possible uh we're going to avoid um you know providing a emotional response to that um so you know and we're going to focus on teaching uh, desirable behaviors and associating those desirable behaviors when they happen with what it means. What's what is what is that going to mean for you in the future? Is it going to be a big improvement? We want to make sure that we highlight that. And we're going to talk about a skill called stay close, cool, random and routine um, that focuses on one of the steps providing encouragement. So encouragement. You did this thing. Here's what it means for you in the future. So. When undesirable behavior is happening, we're going to really, if we must interrupt it, then we're going to do so with as little emotion or attention as possible. Uh, and for the desirable behavior, we're going to really emphasize it. We're really going to put our attention on that. I'm seeing good stuff happening and I'm focusing on it and paying attention. So avoid, avoid the focus on the undesirable stuff. We have a skill called pivot for that. Focus on the desirable, healthy stuff you want the a person to do again, especially that just okay category that right now is probably not really getting a lot of attention in the environment. So remember, it takes time. And and this is about us changing our focus during our interaction. So we're going to shift our focus away from stopping the undesirable behavior or you know, focusing on the undesirable behavior, shifting our focus to thinking about the desirable things that are happening in an environment and how we can um, provide reinforcement, pay those off, focus our attention there. It takes time. It takes time. And you really, it's really important. It says look for improvement, not perfection. That is really important. Small improvements um, can help keep you motivated. Um, so, Take data so that you can identify those small improvements and be patient. Uh, behavior change does take time. So let's talk about some things that can make a big impact. And I think um, identifying what coercions you're using and identifying the impact that they're having is something that can um, that you can implement quickly and can make a big impact on your environment. So let's talk about coercion. It's a way we punish people. Coercion is a way we tell somebody that we don't like what they're doing. It's the way we tell somebody that you want them to stop. Um, it's it's also damaging to your relationship to use coercion as a way to tell somebody you don't like what they're doing, a way to tell them to stop. Um, they can it can be humiliating to the person, it can feel like a put down. Um, so we really want to avoid this in our teaching, uh, in our relationship building. We want to avoid uh, using coercion. Um, so it's a way we punish people. So let's talk about some ways that we do that. Um, I have 10 examples for you. And before I show them to you, I just want to give you some encouragement that um, you're going to see yourself in some of these. I told you this is just like 
this is the way our society operates. Um, it's the way our parents probably uh, interacted with us. Um, these are not planned reactions. It's not like anyone, you know, just thought I'm going to be disrespectful in this moment or whatever. Um, there are things, these are our, our own junk behaviors. They're habitual um, responses. We learned them from our coercive culture. Just want to provide you a little encouragement before I show you these examples and you're like, oh, I'm doing that. We're all doing it. Uh, I told you it's my goal in life to avoid uh, coercion for a whole day. It's difficult. Um, we have practiced this for a long time. So it's going to take us a long time to practice our behavior change. Um, so here's some things you can start targeting now. Some common examples of coercion. I'm going to just quickly go over these on this slide. And, and talk about them more in depth on the coming slides. So questioning, arguing, sarcasm, or teasing. Force, which could be verbal or physical. Threats, criticism, despair. Oh, what was me? Uh, lecture, logic, taking away, and talking about a person's bad behavior in front of them. So questioning. Asking a question you don't want answered, a rhetorical question. So I'm going to ask the same question twice. What time is it? Do you know what time it is? Do you know what time it is? So oftentimes asking a question uh, that you don't really want answered involves some body language or tone of voice there. You know, I asked the same question, do you know what time it is in two different ways? And they had two very different meeting, meanings. When I said, do you know what time it is? Clearly you're late. And I'm telling you that you're late by making a, a very concerned face and, um, questioning your behavior that is can definitely be seen as a put down or disrespect and again these are not planned responses they're common behaviors that we're doing that are not helpful to our relationships so asking a question you don't really want answered or a rhetorical question would be one example of coercion arguing and this is you know just the back and forth between two people so if you start to realize that you're um you're providing more responses, more examples of why you're right as you go back and forth with someone, you found yourself arguing. I want to encourage you that people do not change their opinions. Um, you know, the, the challenging of someone's point of view um, is, is unlikely to uh, change Uncle Bun's mind. You're not, you're not going to convince him that you're, that you're correct. Um, the argument can be a worsening for the person. Again, body language, tone of voice really affect um, the context of arguing. Um, and I appreciate this last point here that arguments don't often result in a compromise or agreement. Like, it's just not going to help. It's really that back and forth of um, trying to convince someone that your point of view is correct. Sarcasm or teasing. Um, it's insincere. Um, you know, sometimes I think people use these as um, a coping skill during a difficult situation you know staff are like oh today's going to be a good day you know staff doesn't actually mean think today is going to be a good day they're saying the opposite of what they mean um and it's really at the expense of someone else and that's what's important so sarcasm and teasing are at the expense of someone else even if it seems like the person's in on the joke it's really not a social skill that just anybody can do. They're quite complex. Um, so we're not teaching and modeling uh, the skills that we want people um, to use in their relationship. And we're really showing them kind of the opposite. It's it, sarcasm specifically is a, quite a complex uh, social skill. So um, I'm trying not to get on my soapbox about this one, but I think I covered all my points. It's generally at someone's expense. Um, person might, you know, not really be in on it. It's not a skill that they can recreate, um, with their, with other people. Um, so confusing can cause misunderstandings. Force. This one, um, is pretty, uh, self-explanatory in the physical or aggressive, uh, department. Um, so, you know, when I think about like verbal, you know, like someone being close and loud, um, that would be force, uh, ver verbal force, um, and physical force is, um, is abuse and, um, is a pretty obvious coercion that we want to avoid. 
threats. So telling a person that, you know, if you keep doing this, then this thing is going to happen. You know, if you keep doing that, you're not going to earn your, your time tonight. If, um, you know, if you forget that, you're not going to be able to pass your test. You know, reminding somebody that if they keep doing this undesirable behavior, then this bad thing is going to happen to them in the future. Uh, this really is just focused on the undesirable behavior. You know, if you're making a threat, you're really focused on that thing that you that isn't happening. Um, so, you know, if you don't do your homework, you're not going to go to the mall this weekend. If you if you break that toy, then I'm going to take your stuff away. Um, you know, if you don't eat dinner, you're not going to get dessert. Those are all things that are really focused on the undesirable behavior. And I'm really focused on the fact that you're not having your dinner like you're supposed to or, or they, you know, you're not working on your homework. Um, so. Criticism, if this is when someone's already engaged in a task and you start to tell them how they could do it better, you know, it the that idea of like a teachable moment that this is not your teachable moment. Uh, if they already started doing it um, and you start telling them how they could do it better, it's going to be considered a uh, criticism. So um, it can be something that, you know, if you're watching somebody sweep the floor and it is not going well, um, they're actively sweeping the floor. Sure, you probably have another way that they could do that that would help them be more successful. And before they have the opportunity to sweep the floor again would be a good time to provide your suggestion. Right now is not the time they already started. Despair. Oh, oh all the sighs. The facial expressions that show you're giving up. Um, exasperation, throwing up your arms, it sends really two possible mes messages. One, you make the person feel more hopeless. Um, and two, you might make the person feel really happy. They might have been really trying to annoy you. And then, look, you did. You uh, rolled your eyes or, oh, I'm just giving up. And if that was their motivation, then it worked out perfectly for them. So, uh, you know, I think a, another aspect of despair that's important, especially if you're a, a helper or a caregiver, you know, if you as the helper or caregiver um, is feeling hopeless about a person's uh, ability, um, it's really undermining to their success and uh, they're not likely to be, um, they are more likely to want to give up on themselves too. You're giving up on them. Why would they continue going on? lecture and logic. So I'm starting to feel like I'm doing this to you because I've been talking a long time. I do have an activity coming up in just a few slides, uh, but I feel like at this point I have been talking way too much. Um, and I likely have gone over several things that uh, probably felt like you already know those are things that you're doing that aren't particularly helpful. Um, you know, I'm kind of talking about you in front of you uh, and I just keep talking. So uh, this is kind of like the Charlie Brown wah, wah, wah teacher. If you find yourself talking more than the person, um, explaining things that they already know, you're probably uh, using some lo uh, lecture and logic. And, oh, I love, that is a great Taylor Swift quote. Yes, I'm the problem. It's me. That is, that is like uh, the perfect uh, lyric for uh, coercion in general. Oh, hi, I'm the problem. It's me. Uh, Okay, taking away, um, you know, it's not just limited to like items that you might take away, but like think of, um, you know, time out is an example of taking away. It's taking away the person's opportunity to get attention. Um, so limiting access, removing things, uh, could be privileges, belongings, things like that um, in order to punish a person taking away. We have a tool. We have a tool that I'm not going to get to today, but in the full tools of choice class, there's a tool called set expectations, and I think that's a really good way to help yourself avoid the temptation to take away. You know, if you have somebody who has a a new responsibility coming, you know, if you uh, somebody's going to start driving the car, okay, um, you don't want to be mean mom who takes the car away. 
you can use set expectations to set up a, a scenario where the person either earns or doesn't earn. And so if they, you know, weren't successful in meeting the expectations, you're not taking it away. They just didn't earn and they'll have the opportunity to try again. So there are ways to get around that. Um, and and uh, use like a tool, like set expectations to avoid taking away and really putting the responsibility on the person. And then the, here's my last example of coercion that I'm done talking about all of our bad behavior in front of ourselves, uh, talking about bad behavior in front of the person. So do you know what your kid did today? That kind of thing. Um, this I think happens a lot at shift change or like that happens a lot at like school pickup. Uh, you know, the teacher wants to tell you the thing that the, that the kid did today right in front of them. Um, it's really focused on that person's undesirable behavior. Obviously that's what's being talked about. Um, and you know it's not a great way to uh set the set the next person up for success either now now the the bad situation that happened before just got talked about the next shift person also knows what's going on um definitely unhelpful to your relationship and you know i think uh for this one in particular when it comes to um the, the that it's embarrassing for the person that's being talked about I think that's important too. Specifically on this one, I think the other ones are also embarrassing, can be embarrassing, but this one specifically is certainly, um, you know, do you know what your kid today did today is a setup for that person should be disappointed in themselves and I'm gonna remind them about it again. Okay, those are all of my examples. And now um, I'm gonna, let's talk about what happens after people experience coercion. We say it ages you. So people who experience coercion, this goes for ourselves too, is we, when we experience coercion, people, everybody, it, when you experience coercion, avoid. That means if I, every time I talk to uh, uh, Sarah, uh, you know, it's coercive and I just, she's going to talk about, you know, how like I did lots of good things, but she's just going to talk about the bad stuff that I did. And I, it just, I just can't deal with it. I'm not going to go over there. And it's a thing that happens in, in the future. Avoid. People avoid uh, people who are coercive to them. They avoid that situation entirely, you know. Uh, getting even. Uh, that looks like coercion meets coercion. So, um, you know, uh, somebody starts talking about bad behavior and then I start arguing that that isn't really what happened and things escalate from there. So getting even doesn't mean the exact same coercion meets the exact same coercion. It just means coercion meets coercion. And oftentimes it's ramping up more and more as that back and forth get even response continues. And then escape. This, this situation has become so coercive. Um, I just have to get out of here got to escape the situation entirely. Um, and so that's a thing that happens in this moment. And the, again, that's the difference between avoid and escape. Avoid is something that happens in the future. Escape is happening right here in this moment. And then there's these last three here. So learn coercive behavior. All the examples of coercion that we gave are responses to undesirable behavior. And they are themselves undesirable as well. So again, if we're using coercion, we're modeling the things that we don't want to see. We're also providing attention for undesirable behavior because we're using coercion, not when people are engaging in desirable behavior, we're using it after people engage in undesirable behavior. It's our response. And so it's, our, it's a very common response and that is providing attention to that undesirable behavior. Um, and people behave less confidently. The example I love to provide for this is about um, that there's a Seinfeld episode, um, the super famous, um, the soup Nazi episode. And so there's this soup restaurant in New York City that Seinfeld, this like famous comedian who can stand up in front of 20,000 people. I don't know, huge crowds of people. That's, that's a confident person, you know? And he, so... Seinfeld, this confident person loves this soup uh, from this restaurant, but the the restaurant owner is so coercive. And, you know, if you step out of line, he will ban you forever from his restaurant. And Seinfeld doesn't want that. And so you just see him in this restaurant 
you know, his nose is down to the ground. He's looking down. He's holding his tray. He just doesn't want to do anything to offend this restaurant owner because he doesn't want to be kicked out because that restaurant is so coercive. So people behave less confidently and confident people make better decisions. So if somebody's down in the dumps and, and not feeling good and not feeling confident, they are less likely to make that good decision. So um, there are the reasons that these are the reasons that we want you to avoid coercion because these effects um, are not going to help people um, engage in desirable behavior. They're not going to be quality of life improvers for people. So let's think about when we're doing it. Remember, past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. So we can make a plan. When are we doing it? What's what is what's our form of coercion? I I have a despair problem. Well, I can sigh under my breath, and um, that is my. Uh, that is my personal form of coercion that I am guilty of often. And um, I can make a plan. I can make a plan for that. I know that, um, you know, uh, when I'm tired and it's towards the end of the day, um, that uh, I'm more likely to him and haw about, you know, things not um, about a, a bunch of undesirable behavior happening around me. Um, you know, when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, um frustrated you've encountered your pet peeve someone's being coercive to you these are all um common uh settings for when we respond with coercion so we can make a plan about the ones that um the ones that we identify in ourselves and and help ourselves avoid providing those coercive responses and your big motivator for doing that is Coercion works, and that's why we use it. But it only provides a short-term compliance. It only works in that moment. And that's why it's so reinforcing to us, because in that moment, it worked. And so, like, whew, I'm past it. And in the long run, it causes more problems. It's not making the behavior less likely to occur in the future. I'm going to have to deal with that again. It's creating just short-term compliance, but long-term problems. And so um, I, it really is a matter of beginning to identify when are you coercive? What coercion are you using? Start starting to look at what's happening in the environment and figuring out a way to avoid providing that coercion in the future. So if I'm not gonna be coercive, <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to do one of those 10 things that are probably really what we're all doing. Uh, you, We have a lot of experience in those uh, coercive responses. So what are we going to do instead? We're going to make a plan. We're going to think about what triggered the undesirable behavior of that other person. We're going to think about what triggered our own undesirable behavior of, that it was our coercion. Um, we're going to figure out what the person's doing. What what's What are they getting out of this undesirable behavior? And I'm also going to start thinking about sometimes when uh, in a similar situation, the person engages in desirable behavior. What is that desirable behavior? And what's the consequence of that? What happens after they do that? Is it getting a big payoff? Or do I need to beef up my payoff for that desirable behavior that sometimes happens? Are there things I can do in the environment that encourage that desirable behavior to happen more often? And then I also want to think about what does the person need to do? What's the replacement here? Um, again, a lot of that junk behavior is the person, you know, is a age typical behavior at one point, and we didn't learn a, a skill to um, to replace it with. Uh, so, what does the person need to learn to do? And then, what can I do in the environment to make it so that? that desirable behavior happens more often? Are there cues I can put up in the environment? Are there uh, more people I can train to be modeling these desirable uh, uh, behaviors? Um, what can we do to increase the likelihood that desirable behavior is gonna happen in that environment? And the big thing that you can do is build a relationship. And we have a tool for that called Stay Close, Cool, Random Routine. And we're going to shift to talking about that right now. Um, 
and I'm going to take like a two minute break if that's possible before we shift into talking about um, the stay close builder relationship tool. So I'm going to come back at like 2.06. Uh, to help themselves too. Okay, so we're gonna build a relationship and we have a tool for that. So great, stay close, uh, cool random routine. And here's the steps on the screen for you. Uh, I'm gonna go over some of the more difficult um, steps in depth, but basically you're gonna move towards the person. It's pretty difficult to have a meaningful conversation from across the room. So it's a great demonstration of caring and interest to walk towards the person and remain within arm's reach. Touch if appropriate. There's some examples there of, um, you know, just some uh, generally um, acceptable um, touch, uh, high fives, etc. And I'm going to lump three and four together. So I'm going to be mindful of my body language, tone of voice, uh, that nonverbal communication somebody mentioned earlier. Um, I'm going to be mindful of all of that. In reality, that's saying so much more than the actual words that are coming out of my mouth. If I presented this curriculum and just went through and said, caring facial expressions and tone of voice, relaxed body language, ask open-ended questions. Sure. I mean, technically I've conveyed the same information, but you have, you do not understand how much I care, how uh, important uh, these are, it, I provided no emphasis on, um, on anything. So, uh, you are getting, uh, more out of this, um, more out of the words that I'm saying because of the way that I'm saying them because of my facial expression and tone of voice. Um, and so it's really important that you consider all of those in your communication, um, so that you're really saying the thing that you, that you think you are. Ask open-ended questions. Um, so things that are going to keep the conversation going, that's the intention with those open ended questions so that you, uh, learn more, uh, and that it encourages the person to keep talking. So, uh, a question that gets more than, you know, blue four, yes, no, maybe it's you, uh, information along the lines, not just 1 or 2 words. You can always follow up, uh. A closed ended question with tell me more. So I think it happens often that you ask a question and you just get that one answer, that one word answer, because it was really closed ended. Um, so tack on with a tell me more and uh, you can help keep that conversation going. Number seven and eight, we're going to do a little bit of extra practice on. So use empathy statements. So identify how a person feels, identify that emotion that you see, uh, and tell them. You seem stoked about that. You seem over the moon. Oh, you're tickled pink. I can tell your face is just lit up. Um, identify how uh, the situation is affecting them or um, what you see that they're feeling and tell them, name it, say. I, that tells the person that you um, understand them. You have a connection. Um, it's really great for your relationship. And then use encouragement. So tell the person, um, you know, what desirable behavior they're currently doing and what it means for them in the future. You know, um, well, you're so focused, uh, you know, on studying. I, when you walk into that test, you're going to be ready. You're going to be confident, right? That's what it means to, to spend that time studying. It means that come test time, you're going to be confident. You're going to be ready. You know that material, right? That's the encouragement. So what are they doing right now? What does it mean for them in the future? There's no suggestion there. Uh, you know, if my kid was off task and not studying, I would not say that because then it would just be, uh, you know, criticism or a threat that, you know, they won't know it. Encouragement is the thing they're doing right now. It's not a suggestion of something they could do. It's the thing they're doing right now and what it means for them in the future. And then you're going to listen. 
You're going to listen, 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 listen uh, to what the person um, is saying. So you ask an open ended question. They give you some information. You can respond with empathy. You know, really listening to them is going to help you move through these steps um, and expand your conversation. And then I'm going to lump similar to lumping numbers three and four together. I'm going to lump number 10 and 11 together because. You're going to avoid reacting to junk behavior and that basically means you're going to avoid coercion because how are we currently responding to junk behavior with some kind of coercion? So those really go hand in hand. We're not going to react to the junk behavior and we're going to avoid using those examples of coercion that we gave earlier. So let's talk about empathy. We're going to talk a little bit deeper about empathy and encouragement, and then I'm going to ask you to go back to your chat box, and we're going to come up with some examples um, and do a little bit of practice. So empathy is taking the perspective of others and telling that person. So you're going to communicate to them that you see how they're feeling. So identify the emotion um, and tell them what you see. And, you know, I think it's important to note that empathy is different than sympathy. You do not have to agree with the way a person is feeling. And I think um, example I like to give about this one, that idea is, you know, your teenager comes home and is so excited because their honey's coming over and we're, they're, my honey's coming over after school and we're going to go to my room and it's going to be just like so great. And I'm so excited. And, uh, you know, the parent's heart starts to race and you're like, they're not going in their room. I don't know why you're saying that. And in that moment, um, you know, if that's the moment that you take, to uh, set expectations, you will have blown up that happy exchange you could have. Empathy instead allows you to say something to, to the teenager like, I can tell you're pretty pumped. Um, you know, you've been waiting a long time for this. Uh, or, you know, uh, you just respond to that emotion that they're feeling. And then before the honey comes over, we're going to set expectations about what that, that uh, visit looks like in appropriate places to hang out in the house together. Um, and in the moment, I'm going to avoid uh, being coercive and uh, lecturing them <laughs> about those things. I'm going to take the opportunity before they come over. So empathy does not mean you agree with the emotion or the, the reason behind the emotion. It just means you see how the person is feeling and that you understand that. And encouragement, again, is identifying a desirable behavior, something you want to continue happening and telling the person what it means for them in the future or that they've done it before and they can do it again. Um, so, man, you keep studying like that, it's gonna be like the math test. Man, remember you walked in there so confident, you're gonna walk in there confident again. You got this studying down, you got this. Okay, go find, go to your chat box. I want to hear an empathy statement an encouraging statement for awesome Alex. Alex just got his GED results and he is walking down the hall. Hey, look what I got. I did it. I did it. Uh, you know that he studied for hours. He just passed his GED test. He's walking down the hall with his score. What's an empathy statement and an encouraging statement you can give awesome Alex? An encouraging statement for awesome Alex. I could see you are excited. All that studying paid off. Yes. Alex, I know you worked hard to prepare for this. I think you can do just about anything you put your mind to. What's it mean for him in the future? Wow, Alex, I can see you're really proud of yourself and your achievement. Showing your commitment to passing that GED means you can be successful in your upcoming job or college experience. Great job, yes. You know, I, I wanna point out that something Molly said I think is really important and she said, I can see you're really proud of yourself. A lot of times we wanna say, I'm proud of you or something like that. I think pointing out to a person that they are proud of themselves is really impactful. And that is that is empathy. Empathy is how that other person feels. So I'm, I'm, I really like how you phrased that, Molly. 
Hey, Alex, you worked hard. I bet you can get that job you wanted, that good job you wanted. Yep. What does it mean? He passed this GED. That does mean he can get a job or be ready for that college experience. I love it. Okay. Great job, guys. Let's do one more. And then we're going to talk about our next skill of pivot. So, okay, ju just okay, Justin. Um, he moved some papers uh, so that somebody could sit down in the break room. Um, and he uh, smiles and says hi uh, to you and other people when they walk in. So, what uh, empathy and encouraging statement can, can you give for just okay, Justin? Nothing earth shattering he did here, just being friendly. What's some empathy and encouragement we can provide? That was nice of you to move papers to make room for so-and-so. Yeah, polite. I like that. How nice of you to be attentive and helpful. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I noticed how considerate you were when you moved those papers. Great way, great naming that behavior. Um, it's always good to see your smile. Just, just wanted to point out your act of kindness reaching out to your coworkers. Your inclusive behavior can be contagious to others. Love it. That's what it means in the future, right? Like he's setting that example for other people. Great. Great. Okay. Let's shift to pivot. This is our tough skill. This is that, what do we do with junk behavior? What do we do when that junk is happening? We're going to pivot around it. We're going to avoid uh, the attention that it's typically getting. Um, so again, let's think about why people do it. Attention, getting you to comfort them or react um coercion meets coercion when they want to see you hurt or angry um to get you to give in uh get you to go away and escape i love one of the videos that we use um shows uh two people sitting on a couch and one of them is picking their nose um the other person has the remote control and is like what are you doing and super grossed out and then they end up um like giving the remote to the nose picker and walking away. Like, well, that just worked out super well for the nose picker. Uh, they got you to leave them alone after you're super rude and they got the remote back. Um, getting you to do something for them. It's what people do, a delay tactic. Um, okay, so junk behavior is a payoff for the person. There's something they're getting out of it. That's important to remember. We also need to remember that the majority of serious behavior stems from junk behavior getting reacted to and escalating that coercion meets coercion right and escalates the situation so it makes sense and it's our hope that if we can avoid reacting to that junk behavior we can help the environment stay calm and avoid getting creating one of those situations where serious behavior occurs where things get uh, worse for people so how do you pivot First, we're going to really be mindful of our body language, our facial expression, our tone of voice. You know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, coercive uh, nonverbal responses. So we're going to be mindful of our body language, and then we're going to really shift our focus to, th to one of three things. One, another person, if possible. So you know, if you walk into the room and um, you know you have one person on task and one person off task. Oftentimes, somebody's going to go off to that off-task person and be like, come on, what do you need to do, blah, 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 and they're going to focus on that person, when in fact, Pivot's going to ask you to focus on that on-task person. Go up to the on-task person. Keep your eye out for the off-task person, you know, picking up their pen or, um, you know, going back to look at the computer and, you know, some sign that they're getting back on task. Um, so focus on the person who's on task until you see some sign that the person is, um, you know, stop their undesirable behavior or started some desirable behavior. Then you can move to number three and pivot back to the person, bring them into the conversation. Another option would be, so you're in an environment and somebody's engaging in some drunk behavior and uh, you continue to attend to your own activity, your activity. It's not you suggesting that they do some other thing. That's a redirection, uh, but you direct yourself uh, to your own activity so that you can avoid re reacting to that undesirable behavior. So, uh, you know, focusing on um, 
focusing, you know, I always, in, in our class, I'm always like dusting the tabletop, waiting and, you know, looking in my, the corner of my eye for um, some desirable behavior. So focus on your own activity uh, until you see the person engage in some desirable behavior or stop the junk behavior, then you can shift to number three and interact and provide some attention for that person. The last option, junk behavior is occurring, and you can just continue to talk to the person. You know, I think the nose picker is a good example um, of that. And then when the when the finger comes out of the nose, then I'm really going to beef up my interaction. But until then, I'm just going to keep talking to them as though they weren't picking their nose. I think swearing is another one where that's useful. I'm just going to continue uh, interacting. When the swearing stops, then I'm going to provide additional uh, engagement and be much more engaged in the conversation. So I'm going to avoid reacting. I'm going to focus on something else. I gave you three options to focus. So I'm going to focus on another person. I'm going to focus on my own activity, or I'm going to focus on desirable behavior that this person is engaged in and avoid reacting to that junk. When desirable behavior happens, I'm going to pivot back. I'm going to really start engaging with them. And I'm going to repeat. I'm going to repeat, 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 because people have been engaging in these junk behaviors a long time. And so it's unlikely that one pivot is going to, uh, you know, bring us back to all the desirable behavior and everything's gravy. I'm going to have to pivot multiple times, pivot, maybe use uh, multiple different types of pivot during the same interaction. It's all on the table there. So why not just ignore it? Why pivot? Why not just ignore it? It can be coercive. People might want you to ignore them. That's kind of along the despair line, you know. Um, it can be reinforcing. That's what they were going for. Um, it can also cause a behavior burst. Oh, you don't see this junk behavior? You don't see this? Let me show you. And things get more out of control. Um, so definitely some dangers to ignoring. And advantages to pivot are that it, it weakens that undesirable behavior. It makes the undesirable behavior less likely to happen last time because we avoided providing that attention. We avoided providing that consequence. It can also prevent a behavior burst because it is an active tool. There is engagement. It's not ignoring. It's um, avoiding reacting, focusing on desirable. And it can prevent escalation to serious behavior because, again, when junk behavior meets coercion, it ramps up and can escalate into serious behavior. So let's practice this. Annoying Addie. I told you about her already. She was picking her nose. She's telling you about a cool package she sent. And you're in the middle of typing an email. So I'm typing my email and annoying Addie's over here picking her nose. What am I waiting for? Tell me in the chat box. What am I looking in the corner of my eye for? I'm just like uh huhing her right now. But what's my pivot back? I'm, I'm pivoting on an activity. I'm typing and I'm providing her some uh huhs about her cool package. What am I looking for? What's my pivot back to her? Her to stop picking her nose. Exactly. Exactly. When she stops picking her nose, I see that out of the corner of my eye. Oh, that is so, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And then I'm really going to beef up my engagement with her. So minimal engagement. I'm typing. I'm focusing on my, my own behavior. When that nose, when the finger comes out of her nose, there I pivot back. Okay, good job, guys. Let's do one. Let's do two more. I lied. Two more. Uh, outburst Ollie. I have two people here. I have Oliver and Sally. Sally is working on um, her project and she's humming her favorite song. She's chill. She's, she's focused on her work. Uh, and Oliver is over here like, this is stupid and I'm going to rip it up. Like, I'm just done. I'm walking in the room. Who do I, who do I engage? Engage Sally. Yeah. I'm, I want to learn about what Sally is working on. Exactly. And tell me, what am I looking for from Oliver? What am I looking for from Oliver? When do I when do I go to him? A shift in more positive behaviors, yeah. So maybe he picks up his pencil. Quietness, yes. He just stops the griping. Yeah. And then I pivot and bring Oliver into the conversation. Okay. Great job. One more here. Meltdown Malcolm. So it's time to go inside. And Malcolm, I, to, I told Malcolm. Um, and he was like, nah, I'm not doing that. 
kind of forcefully, as you can see on the screen, he's like, bull crap. Uh, and there's lots going on outside. There's a lot going on. There's birds. There's lots of stuff I can that I am focused on. What am I looking for from Malcolm? Right now I'm focused on my own activity. There's a lot of stuff going on outside. I'm like, you know, what is that airplane up there? What is going on? <clears throat> what am I looking for from Malcolm as my sign that I should turn back to him? What am I looking for from him? Calmness and quiet. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, you know, in a perfect world, maybe he even takes a foot or two towards the house. <laughs> um, lowering your voice back to normal. Step in the right direction of the house. Exactly. So I'm looking for a shift in Malcolm's behavior. Uh, and while I'm waiting for that, I am focused on the many other things that I could be focused on outside. My own activity. I'm not trying to draw him into the looking. I am personally focused on that. I am focused on, I wonder where that plane is headed. It's, you know. Okay, great job, guys. Pivot is a tough, tough skill. I look forward to um, you guys practicing that and seeing what kind of uh, impact and response you get. Okay, so a few minutes ago, we practiced the stay close, cool, random, and routine. So that relationship building skill. Stay close, hot is the same skill set. It's just that we're going to use a different opportunity uh, to engage in this skill. So in a cool random or routine, what cued us to take that is something cool happened, like the person, you know, something got better for the person. They, you know, like Alex. Alex, we did a stay close cool with because he just got, he passed his GED. Something great happened. Something cool for him happened. So I use that as my cue. I'm going to do a stay close opportunity, okay? And then there's that routine and, you know, those cool and the routines you're already probably doing, you know, you're already talking to people at dinner to improve your relationship. You're already, you know, using your ride home from work or, um, you know, your ride to school as your opportunity to build that relationship, to ask questions, use empathy, encouragement. And then there's the random and that's the, I'm just doing this. I'm going to get better. I'm a practice. I really want my relationship to be better. And I'm just going to create a cue in my environment, you know, Today is a seven day. So it's 227. I'm going to do a stay close with someone at 237. I'm going to find somebody else to do a stay close with. You know, that person didn't know that today is a seven day. And that's why I started talking to them. They just know that I care about them. And I just came up and started talking. Huge impact from those randoms. So random to the person you're engaging with, not necessarily random to you. And as you learn and develop this skill. And then there's the hot. So you're using cool, random, and routine to build your relationship and to practice this skill. And then when it comes to a stay close hot, when things are hot, when something bad has happened, when, when the person perceives that their life has gotten worse, you've already practiced these skills. You already have a relationship with this person because you've been using the valuable stay close skill. And now you can use it in a stay close hot too. So, Again, we're not going to react to the junk behavior, and we're starting there here because in a stay close hot, things have gotten worse. So, you know, it's likely that there's some junk behavior happening, and we're going to start off right then with we're not going to react to junk behavior. We're going to stay calm. We're going to uh, have the caring facial expression and tone of voice and body language. Usually move towards the person, and it says usually for a reason. Um, you know, you need to think safety. Um, and again, the more you practice this in a normal time, the more typical it is, you know, well, Kathleen just moves towards me. That's what we do when she, you know, that's her demonstration of caring. People are used to me doing that. Um, so usually move towards the person in a stay close hot and same with touch, you know, appropriate to the situation. Ask open ended questions. And I think it's really important again to reiterate the intention behind that step. It is to learn more information to keep the conversation going. If you have a person who's hot and escalated and, you know, very openly telling you everything that's wrong, uh, I would avoid asking too many questions because the goal is not to fix it or problem solve. And that's where a lot of questions can take you. So again, the intention behind asking open-ended questions is to keep the conversation going. It is not to fix it. Uh, you're going to listen. It's really important that you hear what the person is telling you. Um, and then 
use empathy. So you're going to respond with empathy. You're going to tell the person that you see how they're feeling. It's really, really important to do that. A lot of times um, people are concerned during a hot time that naming that emotion, that difficult emotion could make things worse. You know, well, if I say they're furious, like, you know, I don't want things to get worse. I don't, I don't want to point out to somebody that they're feeling like that because it, you know, they'll show me when in fact, telling a person you see that they're furious. Yeah, Kathleen, I am furious. Thank you. You get me. You understand me. They don't have to show me any other way. I just told them I see how they're feeling. So it's a really a great way to make a connection and to tell a person that you see and understand them. So empathy. And then encouragement. And again, encouragement, it's really important to remember that encouragement is about if something the person is doing right now. And in a hot situation, it can be hard to find something that the person's doing right now that you want them to continue to do, right? So, um, you know, if you see them take just a small part of a breath, that's, I saw you take that deep breath. That's, you know, you're already doing that. That's a great way to, to, uh, to stay calm, to help yourself. Good. What about them just even talking to you? You know, this is a difficult situation. You're already telling me about it. You're already talking about it. I know you can get through this. You've been through this before. I know you can do it again. Um, so again, I didn't suggest anything a person, I didn't suggest to the person that they do anything different. I just found something they were doing to encourage them about, that, that it would be helpful for them. And I'm going to repeat, <laughs> repeat, 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 until the person has shown signs of calming down. Um, and when, um, when they start to de-escalate and are starting to feel better, then I can, you know, direct to an alternative behavior. You know, if they've been working on a coping skill, they're, you know, and I can say, it seems like you're starting to feel better. I know sometimes it helps you when we do the, the hand breathing. Do you want to do that with me now? Or, you know, this has been really stressful in here. I know, I know sometimes it helps um, when we take a walk. Is that something you might want to do? Should we, can we take a walk now? Uh, so after the person has shown signs of de-escalating, then you can suggest an alternative behavior to help them get out of the moment. And then I need to continue to reinforce desirable behavior after things have de-escalated. Um, I think uh, oftentimes we really just want to move on and hope it doesn't happen again. Um, but we really do need to make sure that we're really beefing up our reinforcement afterwards and making sure we're recognizing desirable behavior and really beefing up the positive consequences available within that environment. Okay, let's reiterate again about empathy. It's really important to identify the emotion, name it, and use a word that really reflects the gravity. I didn't say you were mad. I said furious, frustrated, heartbroken. You know, what, is, what are they really feeling? The more you connect, the more you tell them that you see how they're feeling, uh, the less likely they are to have to show you in some kind of way. That could escalate things. So let's do an example here with sad Sammy. Let's talk about sad Sammy. Sad Sammy had an argument with her roommate. And when this happens, it it happens often, and when it does, it often leads to her crying in her bed for a really long time. Um, she is currently laying in bed, and she's telling you that she needs a pill. You're in the living room. Uh, so tell me, what what's an empathy statement you could provide and an encouraging statement? She's talking to you about it. She's screaming. She wants a pill. She's ready to talk about it. You're going to give her an empathy statement and an encouraging statement. can see you're upset yeah yeah you know and with the I like that you started with the empathy statement Janet if a person's demonstrating a lot of emotion you're going to have a better interaction if you start right there start by noticing it 
tell him, you see. I see you're upset. What's going on? So if, if you need more information to know how a person is feeling, you could start with an open-ended question. But in a stay close high, often your cue is that that person is acting in some kind of way. So name that emotion right off the bat. I think that's a good place to start. Anybody have any other emotion words that might be appropriate for sad Sammy? Um, um, I'm glad you want to talk to me about it. I, your, uh, your argument uh, has upset you. Um, I see you're upset, and I'm, I'm glad you want to talk to me about it. You're already talking about it. That's so helpful. Um, you're really upset right now. As hard as this is, I know you've been through hard times before, and you can work through it again. Yeah, I like that. And if they, and if you think they're able to to talk about that, that is a um, depending on how they seem. I think that Molly, you can get to that question when this happened last time. What did you do? I think you're getting towards that problem solving that can happen as, as Sammy shows signs of uh, calming down. You're she's already talking about it, and I also like the idea that people say uh, you're already talking about it. You know, she's screaming that she needs a pill, but nobody mentioned the pill. Good job. You avoided reacting to that junk behavior of her asking for a pill, right? And you focused on she's talking about it. You translated what the specific thing she was doing to that she's talking about it. She's ready to talk about it. Um, yes, go. you definitely want to go in with her and uh, and be there, Janet. Yeah. Are there any other empathy or emotion words that you guys have thought about with Sad Sammy? Might say something like, you sound so hurt. Yeah. Oh, Vanessa, you and I are just like, good job. <laughs> you guys did well. I have a so that that's our last scenario and that's the last of the tools that we're going to talk about today. I do have some resources that I'd like to share with you um before I before we uh leave today. So the first one is a podcast or 10 short podcasts really. Um about the common coercions and I'm just going to leave this up here on your screen for a moment because you can take your phone camera and hover over this, scan that, and it, it should pop up so that you can see these, oh, these 10 coercion podcasts. So those are really helpful. They're going to go over what we talked about today, um, but they're also going to provide a little, if this is your coercion, here's what you could do in this moment to avoid it. So it also has a nice little... Um, uh, pro proactive thing, a uh, tidbit for each of those coercion examples. So that's the first resource I want to leave you with. And I'll, I'll go back to this if, um, feel free to ask me to go back to that. So here's the second one. This is for the full tools of choice class. So uh, tools of choice looks like uh, four pre-recorded sessions. So it has, um, Lucas Evans, Lucas and Ree Evans talking uh, through each of the four, the four modules of tools. You would watch that and then you would come to a practice session, practice the skills that you learned during that recorded session, get feedback on your skills um, and really start start practicing similar to what we did today where you got a little bit of feedback. And then I'm just going to wait for another moment. The last resource I wanted to share with you is a family coaching workshop, which is available for anyone. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really geared towards um, uh, natural home or family caregivers. We have siblings who come. Um, we have a, a parent and a teenager who come together. Um, so these uh, family coaching workshops are based in this, the tools of choice training, but they're really geared towards just small snippets of uh, things that people can practice together um, during these short one hour workshops um, that we host twice a month. And it is a six, it's an eight week curriculum um, that we just do over and over. So you're welcome to come to one or more.
and I can add web links. Yes, Nancy. Let me work on that all for the podcasts and I'll put them in the chat box. Opening my browser. Kat, if there are more questions, if you could read them, I'm looking for links at the moment. I'm not seeing any. Okay. Here is the tools of choice one. There's the coercion podcasts and family coaching. And tonight, actually, this is family coaching one. The first one in the series is tonight. And then Kat says the PowerPoint uh, recording and transcript will be made available on the previous webinar page. Also, these are hosted weekly, so please feel free to send whomever, return yourself. Um, the, the, our goal is that they happen routinely so that people can come as needed and available. If nobody else has any questions, I think that's the end of our presentation.